Okay, thank you. Thank you for the introduction and uh, uh, for the possibility of talking about uh, this work that uh, has been done in collaboration with uh, Professor Kiegas, Professor Riotta, and Professor Riva, with the, the aim of uh, explaining those nonlinearities that, as uh, uh, Professor Cardoso was talking about uh, this morning, could arise in uh, black hole ring downs. And in particular, the aim is to uh, use symmetries to predict uh, those and uh, give a reason why those would be, would be there. And okay, so just to take a step back uh, uh, as an introduction, we, we are reaching a, a new era where uh, gravitational waves are uh, one of the most powerful tools we have at our disposal in order to prove uh, the universe and uh, uh, is, um, and, 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 and the test prediction of general relativity. In particular here, there, this is uh, uh, one of the most famous images I could, have, I could find about uh, um, the, the future of uh, gravitational wave astronomy. Because here, uh, there is the, in blue, are depicted the black hole that have been discovered through the use of gravitational waves versus in red, the one that were discovered before. And this is striking already because we can see that we are really filling on this space and slowly, uh, Gravitational wave astronomy and uh, uh, the study of uh, ring down uh, uh, in spiral on the phases that leads to coalescence are becoming crucial to fully develop and fully understand this window on the universe that we have. Okay, here we have uh, um, a typical signal that we can uh, we will find in uh, uh, those type of experiments as. Uh, as uh, cleaned by all noise and everything. So we have three distinct phases. Well, we can identify three phases, not that, not that much distinct, where we have at first, we can imagine, for example, two black holes in this process that starts spiraling around each other and slowly losing energy thanks to uh, gravitational wave emission. And okay, this will lead to a nice signal, which is us this, kind of sinusoidal motion, but with increasing frequency because, well, as they, they get closer and closer, frequency goes up, up to the point where we go to the merger, where the two objects start to touch in some sense and become one single black hole as remnant. And here we have all this uh, uh, complex, uh, uh, complex, uh, uh, well, very, very complex uh, situation where the, we have the two black holes that touches, gravity is strong and uh, everything is, uh, uh, is messy. But then in the end, after this phase, we are left with a single black hole, which is reminiscent of, of all this process, which starts doing this very tiny and dumped phase, which is the ring down, which is the focus of this talk. Because as this black hole forms, it is a sort of excited state, which decays in through the emission of this uh, uh, quasi-normal modes, so a superposition of quasi-normal modes. And uh, yeah, well, we heard, we heard a lot of talks about uh, quasi-normal modes, so let me recap very slowly what is this uh, quasi-normal mode uh, business. Uh, we have the, um, we can, we can uh, uh, say, I mean, the, the way I, I understood the, this quasi-normal, those quasi-normal modes is quasi-normal modes are the dominant response of a black hole respect to any kind of external disturbance. So if we, in the, in the same fashion as a, a spring has its proper frequency and respond in this way, as, as in the same way, quasi normal modes will respond with their proper frequency. And also in, uh, in, this, in this scenario, we have that those frequencies are determined by the three black hole parameters and only this, those parameters, which are the black hole mass, the black hole spin and the black hole charge. Okay, they can be decomposed in, uh, um, in the real part and an imaginary part and they have uh, uh, three uh, numbers that classify them, which are the, the angular momentum, the azimuthal number M and the overtone number N. Okay, the imaginary part is the is negative and is the, the one responsible for the dumped signal. So as this new black hole is uh, arise in this excited state, 
it decays in the, into its fundamental state, emitting the superposition of uh, quasi normal bonds. So schematically, this is what we have to do in order to find uh, um, those, uh, those, those frequencies and the amplitude of quasi normal modes. So we take, well, uh, the, the usual Einstein tensor, uh, we perturb around the background, and then we, uh, we do a separation of variables. We take the angular part, we separate it from the radial one. We change, variable, we change variables in order to have this X that is uh, basically at the, the tortoise coordinate. So it goes from minus infinity to plus infinity. And we have this sort of master equation, which closely resembles, well, uh, a Schrodinger equation. So this could be interpreted in some sort of uh, scattering problem where I'm throwing some probe from infinity and seeing the, the, um, the reflected wave and the transmitted wave but in the limit where my probe is going to zero. So I'm really trying to see what happens when I mm, throw something into, in, around the black hole, then I, I wait and see how it, how it responds. And so this is uh, translated into this uh, choice of boundary condition, which is purely ongoing at the horizon, I think x equal to minus infinity, and purely outgoing in free space at x goes, when it goes to plus infinity. And okay, so we have this, uh, uh, this shape of effective potential, which is peaked near the horizon at, at the line ring as we saw uh, in the talk of this morning. Yes, yes, and near the line ring. Uh, and okay, uh, here I recapped uh, just, uh, uh, just briefly what are the, the, the notation we will use for a black hole because in our work, we reproduced, we reproduced uh, uh, the nonlinearities for the merging of two spinning black holes into a spinning black hole. So in order to study this, this case, this scenario where black holes are spinning, uh, I just recap what, is, uh, what, is, what happens with Kerr black holes. So here is the metric, and I use the hat variables to indicate the original Kerr ones, except for this theta, which is unhatted and will remain without the hat. So this will be the same as also uh, after when we do transformation of coordinates. And okay, is, here are the standard definitions with the definition of A uh, as the ratio between uh, the spin of the black hole and its mass uh, in units of the mass. Okay, so we have the two horizons and the Hawking temperature as usual. And yeah, when I, when I will refer to the horizon from now on, obviously I will refer to the outer horizon and not to the inner one. Okay, uh, so previously I showed you a master equation which can be used in a, a, a general scenario, but if we want to specialize for a spinning black hole, we have to use uh, Tukowski equations, which are uh, equations uh, that are done for uh, uh, those variables here, which are by scalars which are the comp still further decomposed as well in frequency and as the mutual number and uh, a function of theta, which will be then result in uh, spherical harmonics and uh, the, the radial function. So as we go through the Tukowski equations, we get this, well, this equation will be surely very familiar. And well, it, it has the same type of, uh, of dependence as the one I was showing before. So it's all, also has this peak and uh, the same behavior at plus and minus infinity with the same choice of boundary condition. And those all, always, uh, yeah, we always have this angular uh, equation here. And here I just listed the, the, the K value and the lambda omega with A is the separation constant from the angular equation. And okay, so everything can be done both in care and in, uh, in Swarchi in the approximately the same fashion. Okay, with all this uh, mm, background uh, uh, discussed, here is the, uh, the decomposition of black hole quasi-normal modes that have been 
also was uh, also was uh, uh, used in the previous uh, in the previous talk uh, from uh, Professor Cardoso, where we I remember here the the, the the splitting new frequency, and here we have the the the, the gravitational wave which is decomposed into angular momentum and uh, azimuthal uh, uh, azimuthal values. So, but this basically is a projection onto spherical harmonics, in particular spin weighted spherical harmonics. And each of those uh, LM, HLM, is further decomposed into overtones. So for each L and M fix, so we have the, the sum of all, over all of these uh, uh, amplitude factors, A, L, M, N, times e to the i omega, the frequency of the quasi normal mode, times, well, u, which is here, minus up. And okay, so this is also, uh, well, in, in, in particular, this is done also, also because the imaginary part of quasi normal modes, as n increases, becomes in absolute value bigger, but so it becomes damp, more and more damped. So the, the, the other, the, over, the other overtones will count way less and less because they're more damped in this in frequency. And okay, so our focus will be on the amplitude A L M N because uh, as Professor Carlos was saying, uh, there is this uh, um, nonlinearities that uh, arise in this into this amplitude. So this amplitude is in principle, made by the sum of all the amplitudes that can arise also at nonlinear level. But typically, they are um, typically they are they are only evaluated at uh, at linear level to say because well, uh, general relativity, uh, even though it's nonlinear, well, the, the first thing we, that we can do is evaluate these amplitude coefficients linearly. But well, we all know that uh, uh, general relativity is nonlinear, so is this true? Does Linear perturbation theory uh, is the linear perturbation theory sufficient? Because what can happen is that at second order, two linear quasi normal modes can generate a non linear one at, uh, as a source. And this will not mix with the other quasi normal modes because the frequency will be distinct. One will be at twice the frequency of the linear one because of the quadratic uh, dependency. Whereas uh, other order, um, well, the, the, for example, the, the L equal to uh, M equal to square will be at a different frequency respect to the L equal four, M equal four. And okay, so those will not mix. And so this is the, 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 the situations. So we have those two studies. In particular, this is the, the left side of the, <laughs> of the, the same plot that, that uh, Rasta Cardoso was, uh, was presenting. So there are the, those two studies done in 2022 that show that nonlinearities are actually important. So for example, here we can see that we have the, 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 A, the amplitude of the quasi normal modes generated at nonlinear level with respect to the, the amplitude for example, of the, the fundamental one is for the case of mass ratio equal to one and the triangles are for spin 0 0.7 are way bigger than the one generated at linear level. And this situation, well, could change if we go to different spin ratio, but the point is they are always sizable, always sizable depending on how we start the fit, uh, those values and the mass ratio. So they are not negligible. And here we have uh, uh, the same plot uh, with logs uh, made from, uh, uh, from, say, from, uh, yeah, this is, this is uh, the, the different study that came out in approximately in the same, uh, re the same period, where we also have the prediction for those two A, no, A44 generated at nonlinear level. We also have, that's important, we also have a prediction for the 5 5 mode generated at nonlinear level. And well, this is, um, this, this accounts for 0 0.47, which is even bigger than, the, than, this, than this one. 
So there, this seems that the, the, the general message that can be taken here is that second order uh, amplitudes seems to be important and present at, at each order. So what we, what we have done to try to understand and predict those uh, nonlinearities, we try to, uh, we, 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 we tried this, uh, this, um, this prescription. So we went to the near horizon limit. So it zoomed really close to the horizon on the black hole on the, uh, on the plus horizon for a spinning black hole. And we also took the extremal care black hole case. This is important because the, 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 the numerical simulation that have been done are done for uh, spin 0 0.7. Nevertheless, we tried uh, this uh, extremal case uh, just as first, uh, first approach to see if something could work. And okay, so here are the parameters. We have J equal to M square, R plus equal to R minus, A equal to M and the uh, Hawking temperature equal to zero. Okay, having done this, we did zooming in the, into, the, uh, into the near horizon geometry is done by, with this uh, near horizon uh, geometry of extremal care. So the so-called neck, uh, neck geometry. Here we, here we have this sort of IDS3 for each fixed angle theta. So as we have a black hole and we slice that fixed theta, we have this sort of IDS3 into the near horizon, uh, into the near horizon limit. And it's isometry group is SL2R times U1, and the U1 corresponds to the periodicity around, around the phi axis. So this is the generator of that type of, uh, of transformations. Okay, this is uh, well known in, in, in the transformation. Here is why we use the hat variables at first, because here we have the unhatted ones, uh, except for the theta, which, uh, this, the theta is the same. And okay, so this is an IDS3 around the black hole. So one could ask in principle, we have this IDS3 that appears. There exists some type of correspondence with the CFT, which could help us finding uh, uh, or predicting the, those uh, nonlinear modes and help us to evaluate correlators. Apparently, yes, there is this scarce CFT correspondence where the asymptotic symmetry uh, in, in the bulk, where it is dual to the global symmetries in, at the boundary. And in particular here, we have a very specific type of uh, asymptotic symmetry group because everything is controlled by this uh, uh, asymptotic, uh, asymptotic symmetry group. So as we fix the boundary condition at this boundary of IDS, we have to find which is the symmetry group which leaves invariant uh, those boundary condition. So we have to, in some sense, uh, identify the transformation which takes this, uh, keeps this boundary condition and uh, find also the, transform the trivial transformations and well, mm, do a quotient of those and okay, this, this has been done 15 years ago by uh, weak astrologer and, uh, uh, and all. And uh, the, the, it has been found that those are the, the, those, those are the transformation, the different morphism that leaves the boundary condition invariant. So what, this, what is the, this asymptotic symmetry group corresponding to this IDS3? It's a very particular one because as we take the charges associated to those transformations, and we evaluate the algebra of those, uh, of those charges, we found that, well, we found that, uh, it has been found that uh, the, the, the symmetry that we had, the U1 symmetry, only that tiny U1 around the, with, around the phi axis, gets enhanced to alpha of a Virasoro algebra. So we get that uh, uh, this U1 uh, is, uh, extended to this, uh, to this Virasoro algebra with a, a central charge of 12J, which is, in, for an extremal case, is 12M squared. So it's an uh, incredibly big central charge when re we restore all the, all the, the, um, 
when we, we, when we restore all the, the dimensions here. And okay, so this, this states we are looking for in this neck geometry are only the one of the related to this so-called left movers, because as we extend this virtual algebra, we also had this SL2R group from the ADS3, which is frozen. So all the states in this neck are only uh, descend, not descendants, the sons, sons of this U1 extended to the Virasoro. The other ones, the right movers, are frozen out. So the duality is not with a full CFT, but only with the left part of a CFT, a chiral half. And you also are at finite temperature with a specific temperature of 1 over 2 pi in the units of the mass. Okay, this uh, has all been done, uh, as I said, 15 years ago. It was uh, pretty much all we need. Because as we have this uh, ideal safety correspondence, we can trade our bulk correlators with uh, the, boundary, the boundary correspondent. And the boundary correspondent in this case are the energy momentum tensor correlators, which are completely fixed also in this CFT. So basically that's it because we have this two point function proportional to a central charge, three point function proportional to a central charge. As we transform to a finite temperature, we get the usual form of uh, three point correlators at finite temperature. But also notice that the W variable that they arise at finite temperature is exactly the same as the phi variable used before. So those correlators are dependent on difference of, on angles. And now we have all the pieces. We, all have, we only have to uh, put everything together because as we have the fixed correlators, we just have to write them in the right variables to reconnect with what has been measured from numerical simulations. So we have the two point correlators. We, correlate, we co calculate those at finite temperature, but also taking into account that we need the azimuthal variable, the azimuthal variable uh, uh, M1 and M2. So we need to Fourier transform the one that we had before because, well, it's the, the, the conjugated variable in this case. So we have the proportionality of central charge, and then we have this gamma function and this exponential. And okay, depends on the, the left temperature. Also, the three point function had to be Fourier transformed. We have the proportionality to the central charge, and then we have this major G function, which is evaluated at uh, A to the I pi, but it depends on uh, always on the ratio M1 over 2 pi TL. And okay, then we relate the, the strain, the, the gravitational strain correlators with the stress energy tensors. We have two point function, one over well, uh, uh, well, with the ratio with the, the, the product of the two point function. So in some sense we cut the external legs. And then we have to do the ratio between those two again. And the last step is to integrate over the remaining part of the spherical harmonics, which is the theta angle I was talking before, because now as we slice the black hole in this uh, as fixed theta, in the end, we have to uh, restore all the variables needed to find the, the HLM that were measured in, in, the, in the numerical simulations. So we have to integrate again in all those angles theta. And here is the result. So, we have the three point function over the, the square, well, the two point function squared if L1 and M1 are equal to L2, M2, but in general, they can be different. And here, this is gener general, a general formula that can relate all the uh, nonlinear amplitude that could arise with the three point function in this case. So they are generated by uh, two linear quasi normal modes that generate a nonlinear one. Uh, but could not capture, for example, three uh, linear quasi normal modes that generate another one. And yeah, so here, here is, uh, well, we, uh, apart from the usual selection rules for L1 and M1, L2 and M2, we can see that this result does not depend on the central charge. So this, the, the, the central charge vanished in the ratio. And this is very nice because otherwise we would have only the well, the, ch the central charge would have dominated on not only the, the linear, not only the nonlinear, but also the linear part, because as we said, it's 
like 10 to the 70 or something. Here is a coefficient, which is just uh, the, the integral over the spheroidal, uh, uh, no, sorry, the, um, the spin weight is spherical harmonic. So here are carried on also the selection rule, but it's a fixed coefficient that depends only on the, on the values L1, M1, L2, M2. And uh, well, it's evaluated for e every value of uh, those numbers. And there is the, the last ratio between the major G function and the gamma function. And okay, so confronting specifically the one for the two, two uh, that generates the nonlinearity as a four, four, we see that we have 0 0.17 found with this method versus a measured value of 0 0.16. And here again, we have the, the five, five, the nonlinearity is generated by the two, two and the three, three which is 0 0.47 versus uh, 0 0.47 that was, uh, was measured. Yes, this is anal completely analytical. So this uh, C is analytical and I, I can show you it's like just, uh, just very long. And the G, the major G function is uh, perfectly fine. This is, a, this is a, an exact result, but uh, I mean, there are approximations here because we started from a, an extremal care black hole and we are predicting values for non-extremal care black hole, which is pretty astonishing. I mean, because, uh, well, yes, it's an exact result for extremal. Assuming, assuming uh, the care safety, assuming care safety, yes, obviously. In CFT and the, if care safety holds, then the results uh, comes. Immediately, yes. Yeah. Okay. Here, uh, this is. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you for the question. Because, well, uh, the point is, here we have. The a spinning black hole, which is the, the which is the our remnant, but it seems to not be um, well. Mm, it not it does not know anything about how it started. Yeah, indeed. But uh, yeah, so we we are thinking about uh, the the head-on collision, but the care safety case cannot cannot explain that one. But I think it's so I think that those that are the gravity most like the four four from the two, those are in the they don't depend especially on the other because yeah, because just it's forced by itself. So when you depend it's showing the ratio. So this should be dependent on the mapping based variation. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yes, but the add-on collision is uh something different. Yeah, yeah. This is for Yeah, this this reproduces uh, the this this the the spinning one in particular the the the, um, the, the zero point seven spin in units of the mass, but the, the the thing is we did everything for an extremal case, which is rather surprising because we expected that for the non-extremal case we would have um, well we would expect something not that close but something pretty different. This seems to indicate that. There is a very little dependence on the the, the spin value up, around the, uh, the the maximum value of the spin. But those and okay, are the those one yes, yes, yes. Those one are from this formula, and exactly. And the the other nice thing is that this can also predict other nonlinearities that could arise. So this is completely general and can predict uh, can be confronted with every any other. Simulation and uh, things. Okay, so it seems that uh, um, what I remember. Okay, I don't remember exactly where was the what was changing, but I think that in the case where L one. Uh, well, compat compatible with the selection rules, increasing only 
one of the spins keeping the two. So two, two, uh, M, N, M plus two, N plus two, they seem to be uh, equally spaced in some sense. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if I understood the... Um, it was about the uh, numerical relativity is only because it's difficult, only two values. And uh, you look at the, the second the zero point yes. four seven. It's yes. A big value. Yeah. So maybe it's Ah, okay. Well, but uh, those two are uh, well. Those two are actually gen generated. Well, those are the only two that could arise at nonlinear level. Because if you go up, you can generate not from well. You don't have only one way of generating the nonlinearities, but more. And here, the dynamics of the CFT enters. So I don't know. Because okay. Yeah. But if you go blind and you <laughs> I could do it. <laughs> no, okay. No, I, I don't. I don't remember which was tested, but we saw that they they seem to they seem to not don't be okay. Okay, <laughs> but we can we can we can talk about this later. And yeah, another thing is this: everything is fixed by um, only by the 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 the, 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 the there is no dynamic here. Everything is made from the cinematic of, and the fixed uh, and, and is everything fixed by the three point function of the CFT. Okay. With different L and M. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, exactly. Yes. Yes, because, okay, concluding, we have. Uh, that of indeed nonlinearities are relevant in black hole downs and may be captured by this scarcity uh, duality. And we are actually studying now, with, because they're still open issues, uh, this, the, the, what, what I was saying before, because numerical results seem to indicate the weak dependence on the speed. And uh, yeah, it seems to indicate that uh, even though in a scarcity point of view, at near uh, extremal near horizon, uh, 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 geometry, we would have an excitation of right modes. They seem to be, in some sense, decoupled from all the problem, but we still don't know. And also, as I was saying, the role of higher order correlators with input the dynamics of the CFT inside uh, this, um, this scenario. And in the end, there is the role of head on collisions because uh, it's another interesting uh, place where nonlinearities could enter. And in this case, that should not be captured by Kersifti. Reasoning, but this seems to indicate, at least to me, that there is some extra symmetries that can be can be used to to predict the results on on the coring down. Thank you. Thank you. We are slightly uh, out of time. I will take one question, and then we will have a discussion session after the next talk. So we'll save next question for later. Peter. Yes. Yeah, Okay. <laughs> yeah. So the time center that you're assuming is the right. Mm -hmm. So you're losing the relation of the mode being not the mode or the problem. Yes. Yes. It seems so uh, yes. But the, the viewpoint I have is that the nonlinearities is uh, generated very close to the horizon as a sum of those Poisson normal modes and then evolves. Uh, almost in this uh, not disturbed up to the uh, until infinity because yeah you're right we're losing information about uh, everything here but we don't have boundary condition anymore in some sense uh, no the horizon is the horizon horizon black hole horizon yes yes it seems that uh, we don't have a lightning anymore here well there is always the, the point uh, where around the well the potentially speak the, the potentially speak around the horizon but as we change point of view we lose track of, of, of all of this but the point is in the scarcity one has to zoom inside this uh, close to the horizon but actually where do you where do you end the IDS? yeah you may not that's you need it for the first order mode yes but then you don't care anymore <laughs> But uh, I, I will, we have to discuss about yeah. all of this.
yeah let's let's keep some discussion okay. for for later thanks thank you